The second presentation attempts to develop gendered insights on practices that are promoted to reduce land vulnerability and water insecurity, such as sustainable land management practices. While you only saw the pictures of Claudia Ringler, that is myself, and David McConnell in the introduction, the study would not have been possible without the support of REACH and a wide group of collaborators, including Kato Edward from IFPRI and Solomon Tirune from the Water and Land Resources Center in Ethiopia. There are many potential pathways from land vulnerability to water insecurity, or as denoted here in a more positive spin from sustainable land management to water security. Direct biophysical pathways, such as those on increasing biomass, increased base flow in the dry season, and reduced sedimentation have been studied. Also, not enough is known for many locations and environments. Some studies have also been done on indirect water security impacts, such as changes in crop yields, changes in access to water for domestic and productive uses, and changes in hydroelectric productivity. Much less has been done on social impacts, such as changes in conflicts, impacts on nutrition, or impacts on equity and women's empowerment. This presentation focuses on assessing impacts on equity from the adoption of sustainable land management practices. We know that men and women have different preferences and face different types and severity of constraints when adopting technologies. Gender differences and inter-household dynamics shape decision-making at both household and individual levels. Therefore, gender disaggregated analysis is essential to informing the design and evaluation of any agriculture management program, such as sustainable land management programs. Women's ability to invest in land improvement tends to be lower than men's, which can lead to more degraded female-owned plots. But in rural settings where household members work together on multiple agriculture activities, some degree of joint use and decision making over assets is common, and we can see that also in our Ethiopian case, where most plots are considered to be jointly owned. Thus, the intersection between gender and sustainable land management is complex and context specific. This slide shows the SLM and complementary practices promoted since 2012 in the, in the learning watersheds. They include both traditional SLM measures, such as soil bunds and stone terraces and runoff structures, but also wells, kitchen gardens, improved seeds, and even improved cookstoves that all relate to SLM, but are not typical SLM interventions. What are the adoption levels of SLM practices across watersheds? We find that adoption levels are generally higher in learning sites and generally higher on men's plots. An example can be seen for mulching, where adoption levels on men's plots were almost 40% in learning watersheds compared to about 10% in control watersheds. However, adoption was also higher on women's plots compared to control sites and on joint plots. However, the gap between men's and women's adoption levels widened. The situation is similar for soil bonds, where we saw, moreover, a slightly larger level of adoption on women's than men's plots in the control site. The relationships only did not change for stone terraces, but as we will see in the following slide, women tend to own plots of poorer quality, which might explain the continued and increased use of this practice on women's plots. As noted just now, women owned plots uh, are perceived to have slightly poorer quality are more likely to be on steeper slopes and are less likely to have deeper soils, and as such are more closely associated with stone terraces to avoid further degradation. What were the impacts of the promotion of SLM since 2012 on agricultural productivity, keeping in mind the relatively small areas and sample size, and the impacts of SLM can take more than five years to appear? we find that SLM statistically increased yields from maize and finger millet of around 18 to 19%. These were also crops with large numbers of observations. The promotion of vegetable and food crops as part of the kitchen garden intervention 
might be reflected in the higher yield for mango. The picture of crop yields on women's plots is mixed. We find that crop yields are higher on women's plots than men's plots from mango, which was promoted, chat and also geshu, a shrub with multiple uses. Yields are higher on men's plots for teff and finger millet. However, yields are always largest on jointly owned plots, suggesting that that is where the bulk of the labor and investment effort is extended. Taking that a step further, we find that being a female plot owner reduces the likelihood of adoption of fertilizer on own plots, while being a male plot owner increases adoption of soil buns. Interestingly, if the plot owner is the woman in a female-headed household, then application of fertilizer increases, possibly because of the reduced labor intensity compared to stone terraces or soil buns. While this work is still proceeding, we can draw a series of preliminary conclusions. First, gendered relations around soil and land management are complex and range from women's own plots, men's plots to joint ownership. Second, traditionally, SLM program assessment focused on crop productivity and land and soil quality impacts and some water impacts. Understanding the gender consequences and opportunities requires collecting new data and collecting data differently. For example, by asking the, vim, the woman and the man in the household. A gender gap exists in agricultural management practices, including SLM. This does not mean that men always benefit more, but adoption practices and yield impacts differ and are themselves influenced by other gendered factors, such as initial plot characteristics. We do find a widening of the gender gap with the presence of the SLM programming in the Avosh watersheds. While both women and men might benefit, the gap between adoption levels has widened, potentially disadvantaging women. To address this, a focus on gender sensitive SLM programming should be considered. How could this look like? We suggest to first assess the gender preferences of SLM interventions. We know that there are differences in preferences for soil bonds, stone terraces, but also mulching. But there could be also differences in the time of delivery that women versus men prefer. Second, we suggest to assess gendered access to information on SLM interventions. Many studies have found that women are more likely to rely on informal ch channels of information, such as women's groups or neighbors, while men are often more closely linked to traditional extension services. Third, it's important to ensure that women's time use does not increase unduly as a result of SLM interventions. This is particularly important for traditional SLM practices, such as soil bonds or terraces. This could be achieved, for example, through labor sharing arrangements. Given the importance of jointness in agricultural management, it will be important to engage all household members involved in agriculture in understanding the potential benefits of SLM practices on women's plots, men's plots, and jointly owned plots. A further option could be to train lead female farmers and support female farmer groups to demonstrate SLM interventions and train and motivate other women. While this concludes the presentation, I also wanted to take the opportunity to highlight another REACH gender product that is just hot off the press. The guidance on gender inclusion in small-scale irrigation was developed under REACH based on data collected in Ethiopia and provides insights on how to strengthen women's participation in this agricultural management practice and also can and might provide some insights for the SLM case study and management practices. Thank you very much.